if you want to communicate, communicate something, you need to go to the network. And the data center can be very complex. So I think Alex has been discussed this morning. And there's something you need to, some delays and some penalty you, if you uh, distribute things around several machines. OK, let's start that. So, so given if you have the training data, it's a matrix, and you have a model, W. Now we first assume that W is not so large. So you can store on the single machine. The problem is that you have a lot of data. So what you can do is that, just like what we have discussed yesterday, you want to run a multi-thread thread matrix times a vector. For the distributed version, it's quite si similar. So if we assume this is a row measure, so you store that instance row by row, what you can do is that you can partition the data onto a row segment. Each row segment go to one machine. So if you do that, you can run a distributed version of matrix tensor vector. Give an example here. First of all, your data is stored somewhere, something, someplace, for example, on the distributed file system. And you have some model. For example, if the model is not so large, you can just store on a single machine. Next, the first step is that you partition the data to a lot of machines. Each machine gets one row segment. This is machine one, two, and M. Next, this machine get the model from that server. So you get the local model from the server. Now you can start computing. For each iteration, you first compute a gradient. You using each machine using the local training data, using the local model, compute a local gradient. Next, you want to summation over all this gradient you get the global one because the gradient is summation over all training data. So you can do aggregation here to get the global training data, global gradient over all training data. If you get that, now you can update your model by just using the current model minus the learning rate times the gradient. This is what gradient is at. Next, so you need to broadcast the new model. So on this model, this is a machine, this is a machine, machine, and this is a server machine. So th this is the network communication. You need to send the gradient to get the server. The server needs to broadcast the model. So the network occurs on between different machines. Now this is a concept. Now we discuss two implementation. One is that you use MapReduce. So MapReduce the, is proposed by Google about 10 years ago, and I think it's the most widely used distributed programming framework. On this framework, you need to specify two methods. One is a map, one is a reduce. For the map, you get some data and produce some data. On this case, you present the data by a key value pair. And you, one key value pair, and then you produce se maybe several key, different key value pairs. For the reduce, for, for the same key, I reduce all this value associated with the same key. So one single key, several values, maybe I produce a new value and associated with the same key. And you can, yeah, you can produce several types of it. So this is MapReduce. Using MapReduce to, present, to implement the gradient descent is quite simple. So each iteration can be viewed as a map and a reduce. On the map stage, each worker compute the gradient descent using the local, using local model, local data, and output the gradient. The gradient can be presented by feature ID as the key, gradient value as the value. So now on the map stage, some, some machines summation over all these gradient values on this key. So you get the gradient, the global gradient. So far so good. So this is the programming. And this is what MapReduce have been implemented. So you have each box is a machine. You have some map machine, you have some reduced machine. So that machine can be run at, the, at parallel. So this is the map machine. Each map machine reads a bunch of training data, for example, from HDFS. Then you compute the local gradient using the local training data, local model. And you write the local gradient onto its own disk. So if you finish, you tell, you tell the master, OK, I'm done. The master then tells the reduced machine, OK, that machine has been done. That job has been done. You, now you can read the data from that machine. So 
So this reduced machine get if this reduced machine is managed with the, the particular key, so this guy will read all the key have been produced by, by the map by the map machine by just the read from its local disk. After it's done, after you write, you get the data and then you output the output the result to a disk or something else. So it, on this case, it's the updated model. So you iterate again. For each iteration, you run the map reduce, and if you have 100 iteration, you run 100 map reduce. Now here is the a demo shows how do you run the map job. So in this case, you have about 300 of workers, that is the machines you have. And you want to run about uh, 30,000 30, of map jobs. And you have 500 of reduced jobs. The second row means how many jobs have been done. The third row means how many are active are, are running now, how many jobs are running now. The, the input data means how many data you want to get from the, from the for example, HDFS or distributed file system. This is how many data you've done and how many data you have been output. On this case, this is the eight, 18 seconds. So now you get about 300 workers and each one run the map, map job. So after some while, you get more workers. You get more, now you get over a layer 2,000 workers, work machines, and now you have each machine runs a map job here. And you keep going, 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 and it's, it's done. So all the map has been done. And you have or reduced all the output to the local, local disk. So now you can start a reduce job. Now you start, start, start. OK, OK, then it's done. So all the reduce job have then yeah, it's not done. That's still two. OK, still one, and done. OK. So this is how you run a map and a reduce job. In practice, you won't have more number of maps than the actual machine you have. That is what we use for the thread pool. So if you have eight thread, maybe you have you want to have eight eight each task. This is because if you put the task small, you can that guy can be do load balancing for you. And in practice, do not use MapReduce if you really have a lot of iterations. For example, if, if you do some feature extraction, maybe you just pass the data a few times, get the, from the raw data, get the feature data to the machine and the algorithm. That is fine. But if you run some optimization algorithms, maybe you want to pass data 100 times. That is a, that's a huge overhead. For example, let's look back again. So, at the beginning, you only get 300 workers, and you keep going. You keep getting more workers. So that is a that is that, that this is overhead. You should take, talk to some cluster resource manager. Okay, give me more machines. Then may, maybe take some while. Maybe a lot of people use that. You cannot get the machines. The second is that you need to write all the things onto the local disk. So you write all the gradient to the disk. This is also overhead here. And the last one is that you, have, you maybe have some stragglers. That means this is the slowest, the 19 jobs are not finished. All the other guys have been finished. Now you have two. This is the two slowest machine, and you have one. So maybe there are some very slow machines put your, put your one map reduce very long. OK, this is. But generally speaking, it's the most uh, powerful, simple mode you can, you can think about. So the next is the, another mode widely used, especially for machine learning, is the MPI. It's a message passing interface. It's, it's proposed by different group of people. It's by HPC people. And there's two widely used uh, implementation. One's open MPI, one's MPIG. So I really don't know what is the difference. I know what the things that there's some slight semantic difference between the API from these guys. For example, for the all gathering things, this guy do not assume you have order between all these machines, but this guy guarantees an order. So this is a slightly different. But generally speaking, almost the same. The, the, 
MPI models do different things. For example, the machines are viewed as a group. So this is all this machine you all the machine you have is from group. And all this machine on this group have been ranked by an ID from zero to n minus one. So you have if you have n processes. This is a problem if some machines die. If machine die, MPI job exists because HPC people do not think the machine can be died. The machine are reliable. So, and you have communicators. Communicator it means you can communication data between a communicator. The default one is MPI common word. On most of the cases, you just use it. And you can define your local communication group so that group people can be computed with each other. If we know the data center, what the network connections, you can define some, something fancy, communicators. MPI program is quite, is quite simple. So you first initialize something and call some MPI functions and finalize that function. So in this case, it's the simple hello world example. So you initialize it. And to get what the rank ID of this process is, then get how many processes are there, then print something. So if you have four processes, you will print, print four pro, print of, uh, lines of output. So the difference is that each will get an ID from zero to n minus one. OK? No, no, it can be, you can be a, you, yes, you can on the same machine, you can on different machines. OK, so it's a distributed version. The goal is to have around different machines. I will show you on that how to run on different machines. So the MPI provides more than 100 functions. If we want just want to implement a gradient descent, it's quite simple. So you only want to use two is, two is enough. One is that MPI reduce. Each one, each worker provide a local gradient to that function. And there's a global gradient, which will be on the rank zero. So you can gather in all the local things to a particular machine. Here we set to rank zero. Now you tell me how many features, how many entries are here. This is the feature size you have, because the gradient size is the number of features you have. Next, you tell me, well, OK, what is the tab, and how, you, how do you aggregate these things. You do summation over here. And you communicate over all this active process you have. So after this function, the rank zero machine will get we will aggregate the global gradient over all these machines. Okay? After you get that, you can update your model. If the model is updated, now you need to tell all these machines, okay, now I have the model. I tell you what is the new model. You can Call it by broadcast. This is this is the data on the rank zero, and you tell me how many data you have, what is the tab, and you broadcast to all this process on this communicator. That is all the machine you have. So it's almost done. To analyze the performance, this is the fig shows how typically you run an MPI job. So here is three machines. Each machine start, it, this is two iterations. Each machine start with computed local gradient. After computing, you do or, or reduce. You do, you do reduce. That is, you send the gradient to the rank zero machine. So if the rank zero machine get all this gradient, now you can update the weight. After the weight is done, you broadcast. That is, you send the gradient, you send the weight to all these machines. And now, if the machine get the updated model, you can now start compute the next iteration. This is not, not so efficient, because you have two resources. One is a CPU computational power. One is a network. So you can run that things at the same time, because doing CPU do not use network boundaries. Doing sending something, it takes a little CPU power. So in this case, you using the CPU and the network bandwidth sequentially. You're using CPU now, the network is zero. Now you use the network, the CPU is doing nothing. And even worse is that there's a battery, means you should wait, all this machine goes to here. That is, you need to wait the slowest machine also goes to here. 
So if there's some other machine has been done, that machine is doing nothing. So in this case, all this segment has been wasted in terms of CPU power. So an efficient, a efficient implementation should parallel, parallel the CPU and the network boundaries. On practice, if your model, your model size is not so large, it's quite small, and you do some dense communication, that means each time you send a dense vector rather than a sparse vector. So you send the whole vector, and you assume you have reliable machines, the re machine you never die. That is the case for your school cluster or your own clusters. And only you are using these machines. That is, you take the whole machines, the other guys are waiting something else. So on this case, MPI is the most efficient thing, I think, the most easy thing and the most efficient system you want to have to try. But the things goes too difficult if you have a very huge model. So if you want to do model partitioning, that is what Koch said on the Google brand, and you have some sparse communication. That is, the gradient is a sparse vector because it's a sparse training data, and the model is quite sparse. Hello. Uh, yeah, I maybe not today. I can show you on tomorrow how to do because now you have relaxed consistency. It's a sequential model, so you guarantee the, consi the model is consistency. But if you want parallel things, it means a little bit of synchronized di distribution. So you need to consider about how the data, how the program mm, performs when the data is not consistent. So you need to consider something about else. So yes, you can. What you can do is that you compute a gradient, send a gradient, but do not wait. The model is coming back. You can continue to the last iteration. Probably use the old weight. Probably use the new weight. I don't know. And so there's some data inconsistency here. Okay. So I will cover on tomorrow. And you have more choices. There's a bunch of distributed system. For example, if, if you want to compute on a graph, graph app may be the best choice you can have. So for example, you want to can compute page rank, you want counting on the graph. So because graph app using a different programming language. So everything's a node, everything's a vertices. And if you really want to run MapReduce, Spark may be the best choice. Spark is like MapReduce, but do not write the data onto the disk. Remember that each map need to write the output to the local disk so that a reduced job can read the things. Spark says that, OK, I can store the data on the memory so that the reduced job can just read my memory. That is fine. So this is Spark. And Ref will be printed on next week. And there's a bunch of the other guys. So because I didn't use them before, so I do not give too many comments here. So, so because it's a tutorial, so Alex te tells me, okay, it's a tutorial, so you cannot cover things too much because Alex has been talk told what I want to present today. So I'm going to show you some demo, how to run a distributed gradient descent. So so if oh. oh no, I just use the MPI to start job. So oh. I do not use MPI's functions. You can use in different things to start job. You can SSH to some machines and start stop it, uh, start it, the job. So. But MPI run, because a lot of clusters have MPI run, so you can easily run, run a bunch of process on different machines. And you, if we do not care about the fault tolerance, so because MPI is quite good, you can control C and everything stop. So if you run some fault tolerance job, you care so, something. The other guys still are running. So you need to care a lot of things. OK, so if you have 
have a laptop, you can just uh, run it. So it's quite simple. So I can show you some demo how to get things done. So first, you need to get the source. And the most important, the most difficult one is to install the third library. So you can it have uh, MPI here. You have some Google library here. And you have some communication library here. And also, you have icons we presented yesterday. And there's some, some small data. If we want to go large data, that's, yeah. OK, so if we want to, there's a, there's a Google Driver link. So you can get the uh, small to large data, about one gigabyte of data. So because Dropbox is out of space, so I, I put on the Google Driver. OK, so the first step is that you first clone this. OK, if you get the code, you need two things. One is the third library. So it takes maybe several minutes to compile. So I have already compiled, so you can just link something here. The last thing you need to get the data. So I already downloaded it. So. OK, so you, get, you can compile the things you can make. And you can use multi-thread maker. So you can specify how many threads you want to have. I, uh, I use eight thread now. So you can combine the things. Hope everything goes fine. <laughs> OK. So go to binary direct, uh, directory, you get in fact, two two things. You can make yeah, you can make all the tests, all the task binaries by using Mac test test. So this is the main the premier server binary. This is MPI because this one can be started by an MPI run. Yeah, you can just use it using a premier server. So you can start by every every convenient startup you have. And this is the you convert the text training data onto a binary form because it's much easier to read a binary format rather than text. Otherwise, you need to pass the strings onto some integer or float number. It takes a lot of time. So what you can do is that you first use MPI run. MPI run is, is shipped with MPI. So you can run, for example, you can create eight thread, eight process, and then you run some, some command. And for example, something like that. So now you can create eight process of the primary server instance. And now you have some server choices. You tell me how many number of servers you want. This case is quite simple. You just one server is enough. Next, you tell me how many works you want. That is, how partition the data into different work group. So each one will get partition of the training data. And for each worker, you tell me how many thread you want? That is, for sparse matrix, how many so thread I want to compute matrix times a vector? So, next you tell me what is application you want. I can do some for you, this simple. I, I will show you how that configuration have. So now you can get something. Um, now this is the training data you have. It's a very small data set. It's RCV1 data set. You have about 20,000 of examples and about comparable number of features. Now you know the data. And you can ignore this line now, because maybe you, we can talk about if you want to run block coordinate descent block something. You can. And it's very efficient during the synchronized communication. The last thing is that for each line, it's one iteration. I show you the number of object function you have the relative object changes. So if, and they show you how many non-zero entries on the model. So if we run, run sparse logistic regression, we get a small number. The last three columns is, you can ignore the first two 
the three one is that the total number of seconds you used on this iteration. Because this is quite slow. But this is quite small. So you, this, num the sec this is less than 0.1 second. And the last thing is that you have created one server and two workers. I just sh show you how many data you have been sent, how many data you have been received. OK, so now go let's go to the configuration. OK, the configuration is here. So you first tells me this is a risk mi minimization task. You have, you have made different dependent tasks or something like that. And you tells me what is the name of this application? What is the parameter name? So because you can run several jobs at the same time, you need to test a unicorn name here. And next, it tells me what the data you want. This is the data on the product buffer format. And this is a regular expression shows, OK, this is the data you have. Next, because it's the risk minimization, it's a loss plus a penalty. The loss we use is a logistic loss. The penalty we use is L1, L2, equalizer. Because the coefficient is 0, actually, this is nothing here. Next is the optimization you want to use. Here's the, we use a gradient descent here. For the gradient descent, you want to specify the learning rate. We use a very simple strategy here. You, choose, you fix the learning rate to point, point zero 0.01. The last thing is that you tell me how the iterator goes. You max pass the data 40, 40 pass of the data. And if the relative object function is less than the epsilon, you, you stop. So this is the ordinary parameter, ordinary things you want to specify to a learning algorithm. What you can do is that you can change the learning rate and see something. For example, you can enlarge the learning rate and run something again. OK, so after 40 pass of the data, you, you go line E to about. So if you choose a small learning rate, OK, you get a large object function. That means now you can safely you know, use using a large learning rate and get more converge rate. And, and you can try a large, even larger one. OK, this time, something is wrong. Because using a large learning rate, you, you find the converge rate is less than, less good than a small learning rate here. OK, this is a very small data set. I can use a slight, slightly larger one. So I first test what data I have. OK, this is, sorry. OK, this is a slightly larger one, the CTRA. We have showed yesterday it has about 4 million of examples, about 70 million of features. So let's look, let's look at the. So each is a part. We have already partitioned the training data onto several parts. Each part has been a binary, a binary record I/O format. Each one, each instance is a product buffer, binary forms. And you have a information here. Let's look at one information here. So it shows that you have several individual feature groups. So you have the group ID and how the feature on this group start, how the feature group end. So we will show on the, um, tomorrow how to take advantage of the feature group so to accelerate the, the optimization rate. On this case, for the gradient descent, we just ignore this information. So, and this is the all group information means you have on this partition, you have about one, uh, 100,000 of instance and about 1 million. 10 minutes of, of long zero interest on this data. And you have about 32 part of the data. OK? So how to run this data? You just, uh, you just change the file here. And
Okay, you can start. Okay, this time you have about four minutes of examples, and about and about uh, forty, sixty. So never mind. So <laughs> you know the data cost the six seconds, and now something goes wrong. So you get infinity grid object function. So usually that means you have too large learning rate. That means you work too long along this, this direction. Remember that if the data is quite sparse and you set a very large learning rate, you maybe go, something goes wrong. That's, some, that's two, two things you can try. One is that you use, using online search to guarantee each time you have a proper learning rate. The other is more simple. You just uh, decrease the number of learning rate. Okay, let's, let's do it. Okay. So here, we use a small learning rate. And let's try that again. Okay, still something wrong. So let's try an even smaller. Yes, even smaller. Okay, this time it's working. So that means if data is quite sparse, you need to have a very, very small learning rate. And this is the, the last is the each iteration using two seconds. Now we use two workers, two threads. In fact, you have four threads. Re remember that each iteration you're using about, you, times, you use a matrix times a vector and the matrix transposition times a vector. On, on yesterday, we showed that each, each operation cost about four or five seconds. So in total, you have nine seconds. Now you have four threads, it goes to two seconds. So generally speaking, the system overhead is not so large. But now you look at that, so it's converge have some problem. So what we can do is that, remember that if, if it's sparse data, the simplest one you can have is that you're using an adaptive gradient. So now I show you how to implement an adaptive gradient design on maybe three lines, four lines of code. Okay, so let's go to the, uh, let me think about this. Okay, here's the gradient descent, the implementation. So you have two, you have two operations. One's computer gradient, one's update the weight. So on computer gradient, you're using the loss, and the computer first gradient, given the data, training data you have, Given the output is a gradient, one gradient. So, okay, let's look at the loss. The loss functions on loss, not jitter loss. So this is the loss implement the loss function. So you have two functions. Once you evaluate the loss, so on, just, on log jitter loss is log one plus exponential minus y times. This is a vector. I store the vector here. It's the x times x times w is a vector as long as the number of example you have and you summation over it. So this is the object, this is the object function of the, this loss. And the second is means you compute the first order or the diagonal second order gradient. So if you ignore these things, the first order is that given these two guys, you compute the tau and transfer x times uh, minus the label times the this value. So this is how you implement the things on MATLAB. So the primary server presents all these things as a local sparse vector, sparse matrix. So you can use an icon three to use to write something like MATLAB. And you do not need to consider about the, how to do communication, how to mapping, I will show you on tomorrow, how to mapping global feature ID onto some local, convert to a local slightly dense, dense uh, data structure. So now if you want to implement the things, the thing, the 
adaptive gradient descent is that this, on this case, you get a weight. You get the eigen format of the vector minus the linear rate times the gradient. So this is ordinary gradient descent. If we want to have adaptive one, it's quite, sim it's quite simple that you aggregate all the gradient, all the past the gradient, and each time you update the linear rate divided by the aggregated past the gradient. So what you can do is that you first copy. This is long eigen. This is this is the eigen array with a temporary t, maybe a double of float. And it's dynamic means one, one is zero, one fixed to view one. One is dynamic means it's, it's a vector. And you, sorry. So you define a delta. It should be a summation over all the passive gradient, the, the square of the gradient. So next, you first say, okay, this is a gradient, this gradient on the, sorry, on the array format of Eigen. So I can have the, the vector formation and the array formation. So on the array, all the operations are animate, animate wise. So next, if the delta is empty, there are So that means this is the first situation. You just set delta equal to the gradient square. Sorry, what is the square? Yes, I hope so. So the element y square of the gradient. If it's not, you sum it. Sure okay. So during update, minus linear rate times the gradient. But you divide by the delta. And OK. So this is adaptive gradient descent. Now you compile it. Sorry. OK, so you can run the job again. Ah, something goes wrong. That means this is not a number. That usually means you divide by 0. So this means there's some empty feature here. So you divide by this guy. This guy may, may be a zero here. So what you can do is that simply you just minus a very small number here. <laughs> you can, you can. So let's compile again. OK, awesome. So OK, something goes wrong. Again, let me look at it. Oh, hey, you mean this one? It's fine, it's fine. Let me debug it.
So this is what I implement some minutes ago. So it goes well, but. Never mind. So what you can do is that. What you can do maybe, maybe there's nothing wrong, but you, the learning rate is too small, so you didn't change everything. Maybe. So net, sorry. <laughs> Why is my tab going? Mm -hmm. So what you can you can do is that you using a large learning rate to see what things happen. Okay? Okay, yeah, perfect. So if we do not use adaptive gradient, gradient design, you should use a very, very small learning rate. Guarantee that you can still converge. If you use an adaptive one, you can use a very large learning rate. So on this case, on this case, you get after maybe 30 pass of the data, you get 1.4 E3. Now you get, okay, you get larger. So that means you can use an even larger than rate. And let's try a larger one. Okay, this guy looks much better. So you go to line E5. This is much better than you fix the using normal gradient descent. You get, it goes to one point of something, E2. Hello? Yes, you can use a line search. I didn't do that because you need to write more code. So on practice, uh, I think gradient descent is not the most widely used one. It's expensive. If we really want to use gradient descent, you're just using SGD with mini batch. It's even even fast, and each each iteration uses less CPU powers. And on that case, maybe you do not do linear line search. You just use a decay learning rate. That's fine. And on most of the cases, you maybe use LBFJS and you do some learning rate search. And the use of coding descent is fine, totally fine. So because a, a line search leads several, several paths of the data and a lot of synchronizations. So you, you can do that. You, you may be just using, choose the learning rate by hand. So, okay, so I can try the largest one you can have. Okay, so using adaptive one, that is much better. And okay, you can use an even larger one. Okay, slightly better. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no. This is E6, this is E7. So a larger one do not work. So maybe maybe this one is the best thing you can have. Okay, I think. Finally, I, uh, okay, I think my time is up. So there's a match, there's a match you can have, a, have fun with. So I can leave the things to tomorrow, okay. Thanks.